In today's lecture, we're going to continue with our discussion about helminths in relationship to immune response. We mentioned it a bit in the uh, helminth lecture, and now we're really going to explore a new theory that's really come aboard, gosh, I would say within the last five years, and it's really gaining more and more uh, discussion and prominence, and it's potentially going to be a new form of therapy although quite a lot more work needs to be done. So I'm going to mention a lot of the work going on now, and, and I'm going to discuss some of the ideas in relationship to uh, what to expect in the future. So just to go back and review, uh, the immune system, remember, is composed of the innate immune response and the acquired adaptive immune response. and most infections involve the interaction of both of these arms of the immune system. So innate immunity, for instance, involves the physical barriers, the cells of innate immunity complement and antigen or antigen identification. Uh, adaptive immunity specifically involves interactions uh, with the T cells and also the B cells in relationship to antibody production. So as you can see, all of these aspects of immunity really come into play with most infectious agents that we've discussed, the bacteria, the viruses, the protozoa, the fungi, and most recently, the helminths. But the helminths have really a very particular and, and very unusual, in, in relationship to the other pathogens, uh, relationship with these immune cells. And in some cases, these immune, immune cells, especially for these helminths that live in humans for a long time, they, they come to actually tolerate uh, these uh, worms, so to speak, that live in digestive tracts or even live in lymphatic tissue that, that we discussed. Both filariasis can be long-term as well as tapeworms. So here's a, a very interesting uh, map, of course, of the world. And you can see the yellow areas of the map indicate places where, or countries where type 1 diabetes is basically endemic, which means, you know, it consistently occurs to a reasonably uh, detectable proportion of the population. And the red areas indicate places in the world where helminth infections are endemic in the world. And the idea here, and this, this hypothesis has been around for quite a while, which is as these countries became more and more sanitary, as, as the sanitary conditions improved, disease, infectious diseases like helminths, for instance, were greatly diminished. And the idea is because of that, other diseases, other diseases like uh, especially autoimmune diseases have not really taken its place, but you know, the idea or the simple idea is with, without the burden that infectious disease provides, the immune system being still very uh, sensitive has essentially turned on itself in a way, and some of these diseases that were never seen before are now being seen, and in some cases are actually increasing in terms of incidence. So one example is type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease where basically the immune system destroys the pancreatic beta cells, and it's the pancreatic beta cells that produce insulin. So type 1 diabetics are no longer able to produce insulin, and they rely on uh, insulin-based therapy for the rest of their life. So there isn't really any overlap here between the red and the yellow. And a country like India, which I've been talking about, is becoming, you know, moving towards being a developed country. It has a ways to go, but interestingly, diseases like diabetes are actually increasing in incidence. So the idea is that, as I discussed before, that when, when these helminths successfully live long-term in the human organism, 
there's a whole dynamic that happens with the immune system where the immune system comes to basically tolerate the uh, presence of these uh, worms in either the digestive tract or as I stated in the lymphatic system or potentially other places in the body too. So, but, but more generally, the vertebrate immune system has basically co-evolved with these pathogens so that, and, and we've discussed that in, in several of our lectures, that as, for instance, the bacteria, as the bacteria develop more and different kinds of strains, the immune system co-evolves along with it so that these new strains can be identified and these uh, immune responses be tailored to those particular pathogens. So the helminths in particular, as I discussed, have been a driving force in shaping how immunity is initiated and maintained. And also, it, it, these helminth infections determine how the body self-regulates and controls these maladaptive immune responses to minimize harm. So we learned in the immune lecture that there's a whole component of these immune of the immune system that actually serves to stop inflammation and to stop the rest of the immune system from continuing its activity. So the helminths are different from the other pathogens because the helminths don't replicate. They uh, live in the adult stage in the digestive tract, for instance. They grow to maturity and they release eggs and the eggs go on and uh, infect other hosts. But in terms of multiplying and replicating, like for instance bacteria, the helminths do not do that. And these helminths can, as I've said, can live in the human organism for many years. And, and they live at that stage, uh, they live in the adult stage for that period of time. So the helminths, as I discussed, are able to develop a, you know, almost commensal relationship with the immune system such that the immune system does not uh, launch an immune attack against them. And um, this, co this coexistence between the immune system and helminths involve both arms of immunity. And basically, all, pretty much all the cells of the innate immune system are involved. And the adaptive immunity, the, the big key player in adaptive immunity is the T helper 2 cell. And various interleukins and these antibody globulins IgG and IgE. So this whole coordination between uh, these various components of the immune system the, first of all, the immune system has to be alerted to the presence of the helminth, and then that alert has to translate uh, itself or transform itself over to the adaptive immune system such that these sp specified T cell reactions and antibody reactions do not serve to eradicate uh, the helminth. And, and the helminth does that through developing or the, the immune system basically develops tolerance and suppresses mechanisms that would certainly eradicate uh, this helminth. So there's this whole crosstalk between the helminth and the immune system in relationship to all of these mechanisms. Now the, the helminth doesn't just uh, launch or uh, develop this relationship with the immune system, it also has a whole localized effect as well. So obviously, as once the helminth first infects, for instance, the digestive tract, there is a whole disruption of epithelial integrity. And these barriers are disrupted, and the helminths and the ova inhibit transcription of various molecules critical to maintaining this epithelial integrity because the epithelial barrier serves in general, right, to keep out things like helminths. So somehow there has to be some sort of opening up 
of these um, epithelial cells so that the uh, helminth can migrate across. Now, in the case of intestinal dwelling uh, helminths, the helminths don't really migrate across the epithelium. They basically anchor with that scolex. Uh, if, if indeed it's a tapeworm, they anchor with that scolex. So they don't really cross the barrier. However, these filarari, um, these wucherias, um, filariasis inducing uh, helminths, they do migrate across the endothelium because remember they migrate across the endothelium and then they go into the lymphatic system. So as, and you remember how they got there, they got there by the implantation of those cysts and those larvae uh, by the um, mosquito, right? The proboscis of the mosquito basically injects them into the bloodstream and then they need to migrate through those endothelial cells to get in the lymphatic system. So by doing that, these uh, helminths actually reinforce the barriers because it induces hyperplasia of these epithelial cells. And, and in terms of this protective wound healing, they actually cause these cells to close up. And, uh, and then by the filariasis, for instance, migrating to the lymphoid tissue, they also alter this lymphatic tissue, the lymphatic system, and they do so by various secretions of proteins. They promote lymphatic endothelial cell proliferation and differentiation, and they actually, in some cases, actually enhance these um, uh, immune cells in the um, in the lymphatic system. So but also they can actually induce angiogenesis as well. Now, what is angiogenesis? Angiogenesis is promoting the growth of blood vessels. And this strategy expands the host vasculature that uh, is suitable for parasite habitation. So, uh, you know, it kind of, uh, welcomes itself to its new home, and then it sets up the new home for potential uh, other parasites to come there and live as well. And the eggs of the parasite can also in induce these granulomas, which are kind of like collected areas of infection, and they can actually enhance the host's capacity to form granulomas. Now, granulomas are, are another kind of reaction that, for instance, occurs with tuberculosis. And potentially, the, um, these, these helminths can actually induce other granuloma formations that uh, are potentially protective for other diseases like TB. And, and in doing this, the actual uh, host is also protected from inflammatory mediated damage. So, you know, even though as we saw in the elephantiasis picture, this infection can be uh, disfiguring, most people who are infected with filariasis do not develop the lymphedema uh, kind of phenotype. They don't develop it. So perhaps all of the individuals that basically don't go to that extreme level, don't have that extreme form of infection, potentially can be protected from these uh, other pathogens. And these other autoimmune processes may be suppressed as well because the immune system as a whole has to suppress these mechanisms to allow the uh, helminth to live there in the human host. So here's some exa other examples. So this immune suppression function that happens with these helminth infections um, occur in the regulatory B cells, the T1 cells, the T regulatory cells. And these cells are the cells that function in general in immunity uh, to suppress inflammation. There can be a uh, increase in immune tolerance where we have these dendritic cells and they induce uh, T helper cells, and they actually suppress, right, uh, these pro-allergic TH2 cells. And these, uh, 
anergenic, I guess you are anergic uh, Th2 cells can go on and induce B cells, right, that downmodulate these, in particular, the schistosoma egg granulomas, and they activate alternatively these uh, macrophages that can also function in relationship to wound healing in these epithelium or uh, epithelial cells. So, for instance, if this is a gut-based uh, pathogen that is in, that's living in the um, in the intestinal uh, tract, these intestinal epitheliums, epithelial cells, which are subject to uh, frequent and numerous uh, foodborne infections, for instance, they potentially, these parasites can actually protect against uh, these pathogens burrowing into the epithelium and then coming across the epithelium to the blood supply. So other places where the helminths can facilitate these protective immune responses has to do with allergic reaction. So we know, for instance, that some people have allergies to dust mites, to pollen, to cat dander, uh, all kinds of things, and other sorts of environmental factors. People can be genetically predisposed. They can be sensitized uh, during gestation. And individuals who are un uninfected by these helminths uh, have these atopic immune responses increased in T-cell activation, eosinophils, decrease, importantly, a decrease in T-regulatory uh, activity. And remember, that's the activity that suppresses inflammation. And so what we end up getting is an uncontrolled tissue damage and fibrosis. And again, this is an allergic reaction. Now, an allergic reaction in an indiv um, with an individual who is infected by the helminths, right, then they have kind of a different cup of tea. But most importantly, their T regulatory activity is actually increased in, this pre in the presence of being infected with helminths and therefore, and their tissue uh, damage that would potentially occur is managed and the fibrosis is minimal. So this is, and again, like I say, this has been, you know, just coming on board really for the last five to 10 years. And uh, it's fascinating, in my opinion. So other ways that helminths facilitate these immune responses are these various ways presented here on the graph. And this is actually directly related to pulmonary immune responses and in relationship, again, to these allergens, right? So an allergen, a skin uh, exposure to an allergen, for, for an individual who's not infected, you can get um, a uh, airway inflammation and remodeling. Again, this is a, now a pulmonary reaction, whereas if the individual is infected with a schistosoma uh, helminth, uh, the allergen-induced, uh, or the potential allergen induced inflammation is reduced you don't you don't you get no airway inflammation and you get repair so these are are various mechanisms that even though the helminth is not living in the lungs for instance uh, and in this case, in this particular infection, the, the pathogen actually lives in the mesentery or in the mesenteric blood vessels. Even so, they actually influence immunity in the pulmonary system. So these are various ways, suggested ways, that the uh, helminths can have a positive influence on immunity. So in relationship to other bacterial, viral, and protozoal infections, that the um, helminths, now, you know, just in life, right, with the good comes the bad. So sometimes helminths can help with infection and sometimes helminths can make them worse. So in relationship to bacterial viruses and protozoa, the helminths can actually reduce immune response 
uh, they can actually increase susceptibility to infection and they can, however, and, and number three, they can reduce immunopathology. Now, in terms of allergies and asthma, we just saw that the helminths actually reduce incidence. They increase atopy on um, drug cures, so they enhance the efficacy of drugs, but they haven't been observed to do anything in clinical trials. Uh, and that's gonna be something we'll discuss towards the end of the lecture. Now, in terms of autoimmune diseases, like uh, as we discussed, type one diabetes, arthritis, asthma, there is a reduced incidence, a suppression of pathology with infection. And, you know, it's, and also I, I failed to mention the thyroid. Some of the thyroid diseases are autoimmune as well. Now, tumors, there is a reduced anti-tumor immunity tumorogenic factors may be actually enhanced. And in terms of vaccine immunity, there may be reduced immune responses and reduced efficacy. So really uh, the, the things above the worm, right? Above the helminths are things that, <clears throat> that the actual helminth infection could make worse or suppress or, or um, bring down uh, unexpected response that you would like to see in relationship to that particular situation. And everything below the worm are, is actually good. So with, with these uh, helminth infections, uh, the asthma allergy responses are improved, autoimmune diseases, Crohn's disease, type one diabetes, thyroid disease is improved. And in terms of inflammatory bowel diseases, as I told you, Crohn's disease is an uh, autoimmune inflammatory bowel disease. That disease is actually improved when the individual is infected with these helminths. So here's some other uh, information that is important to know. So just individuals in general who become infected with the helminths, and we discussed this in the filariasis example, that some individuals actually develop a tolerance with the pathogen and they actually have a much greater burden of the particular uh, helminths of the Wucheria bancrofti actually living in the lymphatic tissue. However, they, are, they have a low pathology. They generally don't show uh, elephantiasis and they have developed a tolerance for the presence of this particular helmet. Now, other individuals can actually have a chronic pathology, but a very hyperactivated um, immune system, where then we have development of this filariasis-induced uh, lymphedema and also this elephantiasis. And again, it, it's not a function in this particular case of how many pathogens are infecting the host or how long the worm is, so to speak. It's actually the, the immune reaction to the helminths that really is the problem. So in terms of pathogen coexistence and immunity, we, you know, we see that bacteria, viruses, and protozoa induce a type one immune response. We get these various interleukins. We have neutrophils, B cells, macrophages, T cells, uh, and various populations of T helper cells. And in the situation where we have a harmful inflammation type reaction, we also have a high level of potential autoimmune uh, disorders. Now, as the autoimmune axis decreases, right, we can uh, see with the helminths inducing a type two immune response with their various cell, particular cell populations, we can, we can have harmful inflammation, which we saw with that filariasis example. We get fibrosis in the leg and potentially those individuals can also have allergies, but it's this homeostasis that is actually protective that 
we have a strong type 2 immunity, we have a strong type 1 immunity, and so this potential tolerance that can occur with these pathogens can actually be uh, health promoting, uh, so to speak. So it's this homeostatic place that certainly a lot of immunologists are thinking is a great place to be. But we also see that, right, in what other types of pathogens. We see that with the bacteria. So when we have a healthy bacterial population in the digestive tract, boy, we see protection from a lot of disease. So I, I think this concept is very important. And I think it's deserving, deservedly receiving a lot of attention. So here is some work going on, uh, very recent work on looking at, and they, they're doing a lot of studies now on helminth infection and autoimmunity in animal models. And most notably, it's in mice. And you can see that thyroiditis, the Graves disease, which is an autoimmune disease, is protected by schistosoma, a particular schistosoma species, that schistosoma eggs are protected for autoimmune encephalomyelitis, colitis, um, and this trichurius is protected for inflammatory bowel disease, experimental colitis, and collagen um, this particular acanthosis, um, can't pronounce quite pronounce that name, but anyway, it's protective for this collagen type of arthritis. Now, again, this work has not been performed in a, cl in a uh, phase three clinical trial environment, but boy, these results certainly are su suggestive. Um, so in summary, the hygiene hypothesis, which you know, is pretty general, and, and most immunologists know that it's much more uh, complicated than, than simply you clean up the environment and diseases change, which we know is true, but it's, it's the helminths in particular that seem to be very important in relationship to this whole idea. So the, that the sanitation you know, but sanitation, including eradication of these helminths, we have seen an increase in autoimmune diseases and a decrease in these infectious diseases, including a decrease in parasitic helminths. Now, helminths are helminthic. Uh, infections are a driving force, again, in shaping how immunity is initiated and maintained and how the body self-regulates and controls maladaptive hormone, or hormone, maladaptive immune responses to minimize harm, and having, you know, the absence of helminths and immune, and the immune tolerances that are induced by helminths may certainly explain hypersensitivity and autoimmunity, or at least partially explain the increased incidence of many of these autoimmune and hypersensitive type diseases. So the first question, would you recommend use of worms to treat autoimmune diseases? Boy, isn't that a million dollar question? Well, I'm telling you, they, um, you know, I like to include the, the underground story, right? Well, apparently there are these um, clinics in Tijuana, Mexico that are actually treating uh, patients with autoimmune diseases with various types of worms. Now, of course, these worms are sterilized, but even so, there, there hasn't been any definitive type of clinical trials that have been done to determine if indeed use of helminths as a treatment would actually cause regression or reduction, for instance, of some of these symptoms that occur from autoimmune diseases or maybe even eliminate, so eliminate them. There's been a lot of anecdotal, uh, anecdotal evidence, but you know, it's interesting because this uh, question number one is very much like the question number or the question we asked in um, the tapeworm uh, helminth number one lecture. And that question was, you know, would you uh, take a tapeworm to help you lose weight? Well, my God, if the tapeworm was sterilized and it was benign, 
right? And if somehow you can control the release of those uh, proglottises, then maybe that's something to think about too, right? Because what's the other choice? Gastric bypass or, or banding, which are again, very, very um, invasive and serious kinds of surgery. So in answer to this question, there really isn't an answer. Um, Possibly uh, people, you know, some in investigators have tried it, right? But uh, the evidence really isn't in for a widespread treatment approach to these various types of autoimmune diseases. So our second question is, what is the worst trade-off? Infections by helminths or autoimmunity? Well, I tell you, if you are living in a environment that has high endemic levels of these infectious diseases, you know, would it actually be adaptive to also have helminth infection? Now, the one drawback or the one of the drawbacks we did discuss in the helminth lecture was these helminths, when they live in children, they can cause stunting, they can certainly promote malnutrition, and especially in an environment uh, like these developing, some of these developing countries where food is scarce, you don't wanna take on another body to feed, right? You don't wanna take on another organism to feed. However, in the sterile, <clears throat> excuse me, in the sterile developed world that's rampant with all these autoimmune diseases, potentially having a co-infection with a helminth may be, uh, may be a, a treatment for these diseases. Now, some of the accounts that I've read about uh, have talked about some of these different types of worms. Um, some, some studies have actually tried or some individuals have tried hookworms and they're a little bit too extreme, but apparently these pig, they're called pig uh, whipworms. The uh, life cycle in the human host is short-lived. It's only three or four weeks. And you can actually, once the that three or four week period pass, uh, passes, the actual helmet completely leaves the body. So that might be certainly an interesting approach to uh, potentially treating these diseases. Now, as an individual, would I um, ingest a, a pig whipworm? Well, I don't know, but maybe if I had Crohn's disease, I might consider it because Crohn's disease is pretty serious. Uh, so in any event, uh, that concludes our lecture for today. Thank you so much for visiting educator.com.